Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Who recognizes this picture? Oh, come on, we gotta wake up here. Yeah. back there. Star Wars. Star Wars. Episode 6. <laughs> Return of the Jedi. It's a real place. This is what George Lucas and company showed you. And this is a picture I took. All pictures in this talk are ones that I did. All the mispronunciation of Spanish that you'll hear are because of my Spanish teacher right here. <laughs> no, not, not really. Actually, thanks to Tori and Jackie, I might even say a few of these places correctly. This is the Mayan temple. This tall place is the, we simply called Mayan Temple 4. It's at a place called Tikal, and it's in northern Guatemala. One of the places you won't visit here today is a group. No Photoshop. It's all jungle, other than any places where they have uncovered Mayan ruins. <coughs> what happened to the Mayans? Yes. Still there. That's right. Couldn't hear. The question was that I posed is what happens to the Mayans? And the answer is, they are still there. But they've had some difficulties along the way, and that's what we're talking about. Now why do we care? Because it's interesting? Why else do we care? It can happen to anybody. It can happen to anybody. There are lessons here for our society and for other societies. Depletion of resources, I've heard over here. Other, other, other reasons why we care what happened in life. History. History. I love it. I minor in history. I'm, I'm an engineer, but I minor in history. And when I travel, and my wife back there will attest, when I travel someplace, I do not want to be the ugly American church that knows nothing about the people, the history, the culture, the music, cuisine of the place that I visit. So if you don't remember anything about the Mayans, remember all these places have wondrous things to learn. These are some of the books that I've read that inform both the trip and this talk. The Mayans then and now occupy the Yucatan Peninsula going up and down from there. So we've got Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and actually El Salvador. That's, you can say my territory, that's, that's it. And all these little icons on this map are all Mayan ruins that you can go visit today. Four of them, my wife Robin and I visited a few years ago, and we'll talk about that in the context of who were these people <laughs> In terms of lessons, individuals, communities, civilizations, when challenged, when there's a problem, when there's an issue, there's four options. They fight the problem, be it invaders, you can flee, the flight or fight, you can submit, or you can give up. That's true whether you're the Vikings in Iceland, the Mayans, the Incas, the Romans, or the Americans in 2018. So we'll start in Tikal. Tikal is in northern Guatemala. Right here. The only way to get there is either drive from southern Guatemala or as we did through Belize. It is uh, one of the more interesting border crossings. Uh, it's, it's like a movie set. It 
it took us hours to get through the bureaucracy and the pleading and begging and so forth. But it was worth it. <coughs> to call, there are traces going back 11,000 BC. Agriculture as early as 1,000 before Christ. Their heyday was essentially 800 years. They had a single dynasty in this city state. Lasted 800 years, and there were about 33 rulers. Now, compare that to the United States. Our average term that a president is in the White House, we can consider some are four and some are eight. Roosevelt was different, others died in office. The average length of time we have had presidents is five years. And we're on president number 45. These people went 800 years and only had 33 rulers. Quite a stable place. The core population of, the, of where there are rulers is about 125,000. But in the greater metropolitan area, up to a half million. So we're not talking about a little hamlet here. This is a large community. The temple that I showed you has a height of 70 meters. And we'll compare that to other uh, pyramids pretty soon. And the astounding thing to me is that their water for this civilization was simply what they could collect from rain. No underground aquifers like we have in Idaho Falls. No rivers. They collected the water for this many people from rain. But then things went bad, and in the course of essentially 70 years, they went from pretty high up as a civilization to abandoning the call. <coughs> Some things you can see in Tikal, this is a tree of life. Jory, how would I pronounce? Well, that's, this, is, this is mine. <coughs> that's mine, and I'm not even going to try that. How would I say that in, in Spanish? Cybal? Cybal? I guess he... Anyone want to yell out how to pronounce it? Cybal. I'll, I'll buy it. It's, it's their sacred truth. It's true life. And it connects the sky, where we live, and the ground. All of of course, have, have different religions. The Mayans are, are, are no different. This is one of the paths as you're walking into the ruins. You can't just park and walk in the building and they make you walk a bit. And it's good because you get a sense of where you are. Just driving here is a non-trivial proposition. It's very thick jungle. And that's one of the reasons we don't know as much about the Mayans as we might like. Because of that. So these are some of the ruins that have been uncovered from the jungle. That's, that's Robin standing there posing. It's quite an interesting place. This is one of the temples. And on top of this is, is one of the places I took, uh, I took all those other pictures. Now, how does this pyramid compare? Well, 70 meters is here. If you've been to the Louvre in Paris, that's this pyramid. Pyramid in uh, Chichen Itza, which I'll show you later. There. Egypt, we're up in here. And then you get into the 20th and 21st century, the Luxor period, uh, pyramid and, and whatnot. And we'll see this next day at work. Cute little thing I found on the lawn. Yeah. So the North Koreans are building that pyramid. That's in London. There's a Transamerica one in San Francisco. In ancient days, tallest pyramid anywhere in the world, about 147 meters. It's a great pyramid in uh, Giza. But the tallest pyramid in the Americas is basically where we were. It's 
close. This is outside Mexico City. It's about the same time. A little calibration. It's quite, quite an advanced civilization, especially for its time. Where the PowerPoint degree is not out there. A lot of the dwellings were at ground level with thatch roofs on top of it. This is thought to be one of them. And even when we were there a few years ago, they knew that there were things that had not been uncovered yet. It cost money to tear away the jungle. So there's a pyramid under that, and they don't know what exactly it looks like because it's covered. Just this month, a report was made public using LIDAR <coughs> to look essentially underneath the jungle. This is actually the same pyramid. And this is what it looks like underneath the jungle as, as the uh, laser examination, LIDAR examination reveals. This is the area around Tikal, and they, there are in the jungle all kinds of different structures that people have not known about for probably a thousand years. Jungle huts. The population density, there's speculation, and it can only be speculation, is that the population density might be three to four times the numbers I gave you before. So imagine a million or more people living in this jungle a thousand years ago. And then the civilization collapses. Mm -hmm. There are hidden in the jungle defensive walls, pyramids, as high as seven-story buildings. I challenge you to see this structure in that jungle. That's what's there. And, and, and this was just earlier in February. <coughs> so I had to change my talk. <laughs> there are roads. I'll show you some roads later in the talk that have been uncovered from the jungle. The Mayans used roads, even though they did not have the wheel, cart, <coughs> or horse drawn, anything. They used roads just walking. The Mayans had city-states, like the Greeks did. And perhaps it's a digression, but I'll compare and contrast. You've all heard about the Aztecs. The Aztecs were a, a central empire, like Rome, the Roman Empire. The Mayans did not. They never had that. They were a city-state, much more akin, structurally, to Greece. The Greek city centers. Well, a city state up near Mexico City, but predating the Aztecs, uh, controlled the call as early as 378 AD. But then this civilization collapsed, and, the, and these particular folks in Tikal continued. And the collapse of the southern part of the Mayan civilization has been called one of the greatest archaeological mysteries that's been unsolved. There are books written on such things, and some of them are here. We don't know exactly what happened. The dominant thought is that when the cities fell, Population dropped by a third. That's not 100%. It's not 90%. It's a third. So the people, most of them, were still there. Dominant thought is that they had gone past what the population carrying capacity of their technology and their rainfall and their agriculture could survive. Too many people, war, tried to grow more food, that led to the population fearing the invasion, so they huddled closer to the inner city, if you will. Imagine everyone in Boise trying to move toward Boise instead of, say, Meridian or Eagle. 
That leads to more environmental damage. That leads to more problems, more war, more conflict, and population drops. So that's a dominant theory. Another one, which is actually several, but another variation of this is to put more emphasis on drought, which would explain why a whole region in southern Mayan territory tended to, population tended to shift to the north, perhaps disease. Personally, I don't believe the disease theory very much because if there had really been disease in that time period, you wouldn't have seen a population drop in the third if it had been catastrophic. Much, more, much deeper. But the thing is, we don't exactly know. The two of the reasons we don't know are jungle and space. Jungle, I've already showed you, the jungle there grows and it hides what is there. The Spanish, and I'll talk more about that later, they got, when they took over this territory later, they got into their heads that they should destroy all Mayan written documents. And with four exceptions, they succeeded. Now, as we uncover more structures down there, maybe they'll find documents that survive the Spanish. But the Spanish tried to destroy Mayan history. Mm -hmm. Come back to this. Fight, flight, submit, self-destruct. Well, city-states, the Mayans, just like the Greek city-states, they fought each other all the time. <laughs> and if you're too unhappy in Tikal or any of these places, you can melt into the jungle and it it's not easy to find you. And there's stuff growing on trees to eat. And you go find, go someplace else and go start farming. That's what a lot of them did. Now, overpopulation is a term I used before, and that's dependent on technology. How much you can support depends on what technology you have. In the same sort of time period that we're talking about, if you look at the Chinese, the Middle East, Europe, North Americans, and South America. They did not have aqueducts, as the Romans did. They did not have wheel borne carts or wind-powered ships. They never developed those. They did not use iron or steel or any structural metal. They never invented those. They did not have as many weapons, as many resistances to disease. And when the Spanish got here, that became very important. They had fewer options on grain and food animals. So the Mayans built what I showed you, the Aztecs in a different area, the Incas down south. They did those things without a lot of the technology that was in Europe, the Middle East, India, and China. Less technology meant they could support a lower population. It also meant that there was less incentive to stay together, less ability to stay together, both directions, in larger communities. You didn't have to go into town to go buy a, a, some metal structure. But there wasn't one. Now, why were the Native Americans, North and South, why did they have less technology? Anyone who has their own? So less mineral resources that they could actually get onto because the humidity would rust the irons or anything like that. And they had, so they couldn't mine it, so they couldn't smelt it, they couldn't access it. Joel's answer is that there was, thanks to the humidity, water, less ability to mine, smelt, and use various metals. Anyone else? I would say that the, uh, their life was too easy. There wasn't an incentive to come up with with inventions necessary because if they, were, they weren't whole usually. You mean like us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I think it was 
there was less incentive because the lot was easier. It's easier to survive. Maybe. Another answer here is they didn't need to. It was easier to survive. And, and personally, I think that's, that's also part of it. Well, there's a book I want to recommend. Guns, Guns, and Steel. My copy's over there. It's one of the most important nonfiction books I have read in my life. And Mr. Diamond's answer to the question he poses is essentially geography. If you imagine for the map, a moment, the map of Europe, Africa, Asia. From Spain and Morocco all the way across through China, it's possible to travel by land. And because it's the same latitude, roughly, a lot of the crops and animals that are in one place can be used and can travel thanks to you, back and forth along that path. It takes a long time. So that's why when wheat was domesticated in one place, wheat was eventually available all across that path. The same thing with cows, and pigs, and so forth. The Americans go north-south. It doesn't work. The Mayans tra uh, traded with themselves, with the Caribbean, to some degree with the Aztecs later, but here is big, thick jungle if you try to go south. And besides, things that are too far south don't live with lions there, and vice versa. So geography worked against the lions. Mm -hmm. So another, another place we visited, Koba, up toward close to Cancun. Pottery, wood, palm tree structures. 2,000 years old. It became a regional center of control. It controlled water, which was important. But they did it differently than the Mayans did in the top. Farmland turned out. They lost a bit around 1,000 years ago with another community we'll talk about. And this place was abandoned about the time the Spanish showed up. Another pyramid. There's my wife who <laughs> conquered that pyramid. It's one of the few that you are allowed to walk all the way to the top. This is one of their sports stadiums. These rings here, the objective was to. You see this ring here? The objective was to get a ball through the Missouri. Kind of basketball, but only oh, yeah. sort of sideways. Um, yeah, that's right. So in that sense, more like soccer. Uh, in some places, and I'll show you an example, uh, failure to win was a lot more important than it is today. <laughs> Life and death struggle. You think Super Bowl's big news and you know lots at stake? Imagine those consequences. Tulum is on the coast. It served as the port for Koba. And they survived 70 years after the Spanish showed up. When the Spanish showed up with their advanced weapons, and unbeknownst to them, there are diseases that locals did not have. See, not, again, the Africa to China story, diseases travel back and forth as well. So a certain fraction of the population had become immune to smallpox and typhoid and all those lovely things that had evolved over time. The Americans didn't have those resistances. So when Americans made contact with Europeans or vice versa, the diseases preferentially went in one direction. And that was European diseases 
kill the Americans. No one understood the germs were at the top, but it was ultimately a consequence of geography. But despite all that, Tulum was occupied by Mayans for 70 years after the Spanish showed up. It's a darn pretty place to live. Supposedly it's a, a training center. I think it was for the rich and famous myself. <laughs> um, it was in a relatively large community. And quite a lot of it survived to this day. It's, it's, it, I highly recommend it. It's a lot easier to get to this to call. Now, you, you look at that and tell me that, that this was not a vacation spot, okay? <laughs> I mean, really, I don't know who had the option of going there and how much it cost and whatever the currency might have been. I mean, really, this, 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 was, this was big news. Another bit of new information, this was last month, but we're still making this, this discovery. They, they now mapped 358 flooded water systems near Tulum. And the announcement last, uh, last month was the largest underground river system anywhere in the world. Natural. 215 miles. So it's, their water was underground rivers and so forth that had access from above. Pictures later to come. So the mines were clever enough to be able to use different ways of getting it water. In Tikal, they knew how to collect rainwater. Peru, Kapa, Tichenza, they used underground water. Other places, coast, other places, river. So the mines were not stupid. They didn't have time to at the time. But they had different ways of dealing with the need for water. So finally, last place I'll take you to is Chai Chen Itza. I know I have to make a choice, so you know, don't give me any bad ones. <laughs> it was a regional center, but note that it was older, I mean, a, a later period of time, closer to today, than to call. The growth in, in uh, Chai Chen Itza correlates roughly with the decline in southern Maya. It was abandoned in the 1200s. Can't blame the Spanish. The Spanish weren't here yet. Another place uh, basically got into a, flight, a fight with uh, these folks and the other folks won. When the Spanish arrived in the 1500s, they found people living there. But they weren't using the city. Except some of the specific cenotes, and I'll show you a picture. And even while we were there, we saw some people coming in and performing a, a religious a ceremony inside the ruins. So they stopped using them as a central place for religion and trade, but the people were still living in the jungle, at least a good, goodly fraction. You've all seen this pyramid probably, that's me. Well, I, some proof that was not Photoshop, but yeah, I was there. Uh, it's a large city, it was. A large trading and religious center. Roads. Then and now, roads are important. This is one of the old Mayan roads, and now you can see it's literally street vendors where one can spend as many pesos as you want. Uh, and there will be lots of people who want to help you spend <laughs> pesos. But this is not exactly a quick build road. Okay? They, they were serious about building roads. If, if one of these people were standing here, this is about six feet above the surrounding ground. And all this is rock. And they didn't have John Deere equipment to move all those rocks. That was all by hand. 
No wheeled carts to move any of that stuff either. That was all human labor to build that for miles and miles and miles through the jungles. So they had to really want to do it. At least somebody did. This is a sports stadium. Remember those rings? Here they are again. Getting the ball up through there without using your hand doesn't look too easy to me. Now, I'm not one of these seven footers or anything, to be honest. Still, you can see the size of your average tourist here. This structure up here. Sorry? Steve, what was the ball made of? I don't remember. Probably have rubber. Rubber? Up here, this structure in the corner is one of the places that royalty or officials would sit. And at least for some of the events, the consequence of losing a whole lot worse than the Super Bowl. So they they took they took their sports quite seriously. Uh, death, sacrifice, and so forth was part of the culture. This uh, set of skulls, and someone has gone into catalog and no two skull carvings are the same. And it was in part intended to terrorize captains who would make it. And I personally don't think it was successful. Uh, this was a uh, astronomical Observatory. It even kind of works, you know, the dome of the of observatory that, that we were doing. They knew a lot about the movement of the stars and the planets. And they did it all without computers and iPhones and all that sort of stuff. This cenote, the cenote is Spanish word, basically a somewhat circular hole going down in the water table. This is particularly important because this was sacrificial. So people would be sacrificed and tossed in there. So there's all kinds of bones in there. I didn't identify that. This is another cenote nearby that was used for clean water and Today it's used for swimming. And you see some folks swimming here. Those of you who know my wife know that she, of course, did swim there, as did I. It was quite, quite nice in a hot December day to go swimming. Yeah. How did you get down there? Ah. A, you pay money. <laughs> B, you take steps all the way down. So these people are on a platform. This person is either putting on or taking off clothes, and then steps down into the water. In the old days, maybe people just jumped in. I don't know. <laughs> they, I, they don't allow that now. And you, you know, these these streets. These, this this is not the Photoshop. It's also not something wrong with my camera lens. These are vines. This it's still jump here. So one way to perhaps climb out. At night, if you visit Chichen Itza, they light the place up for you. It's quite pretty. And one of the things they show you is the Mayans built this temple in such a way that twice a year, I think it's on the Google Maps if I remember right, uh, at sundown it is, you get a lighting image that's sort of like a snake. So they, like the Egyptians and other societies, they were into arranging and orienting their buildings so that they had a uh, astronomical, or I should say, astrological purpose. Well, 
Oh, that, no, that, that, that was just aided by lights, uh, whatever day in December we happen to be here, early December. So I mentioned something about the Spanish. The Spanish, from the standpoint of the Mayans, the Spanish got here at a good time for the Spanish and a bad time for the Mayans because there had been a rebellion in Mayapan, which was a dominant city in northern Yucatan Peninsula, and the Mayans were disorganized. Always helps when you invade and the people you're invading are disorganized. Mayan traders met Columbus, 1502. First battles 15 years later, within a century, the diseases that the Spanish brought over killed 90% of the Mayan population. And they managed to destroy all but four of the Mayan paper documents. There are, who knows what we might have learned about these people had it not been for that effort. Most Mayans were conquered, but it took, you know, a few decades for the Spanish to conquer the Mayans. This is in contrast to what happened with the Aztecs, where they, the Spanish used trickery, they basically got rid of the top guy in the Aztec Empire, and took over the Aztec Empire all at once, roughly speaking. Here they had to conquer the Mayan city-states one at a time. There was no centralized government they could just take over. And the last Mayan city did not fall until 1696. So from the time the Spanish first contacted the Mayans, 1502, to the last Mayan city being conquered was almost 200 years. The Mayans put up a big fight. The last place that fell, say, town, uh, not far from Chicago, the kind of Closing the and even after Mexican independence, the Mayans still rebel every so often. We say through 1860. So the Mayans are still there, and they are not finished putting up a fight. They don't necessarily like the central Mexican government any better than they like the Spanish. Take away thoughts. They're still there, but they lost the civilization they once had and their independence. The jungle and the Spanish have destroyed a lot of information and evidence. So there's some things we'll never know. There is not a single reason for the declines. As I think I showed you. The declines happen in different times and different places. There's not one single lesson here. Overpopulation relative to the water supply and technology. Certainly part of the story. There were almost constant warfare city to city, and quite often rebellions within cities. It's easier to melt into the jungle. As we said, this is a place where you could not as easy to live here by yourself, out on the sacred of the plane, perhaps, than it was there. And what all those first things didn't do to the Mayans, the Spanish, and Spanish diseases, did the rest. And we're still finding out things about the Mayans. So, go down there and find some more. <coughs> Make your own discoveries. Or go off into the jungle and find some place that no one's seen in hundreds of years. It is literally possible to do that. The lions are, are interesting people. They have they have kept their own language. I wouldn't begin to try to pronounce it. It does not sound anywhere near Spanish, of course. It's, it's a completely unrelated language. And they're the underclass. Spanish and, and high Spanish uh, ancestry are the ones that dominate the Yucatan Peninsula today, today. And the, the Mayans are, I say, low on the turn. Right? How did you communicate with them? 
English and my wife speaks Spanish. Bless your wife. Yes. <laughs> Questions or comments? Aren't um, many of the uh, Mexicans and other, um, I guess, people in Belize have a great percentage of Mayan heritage in the mm -hmm. I would think that, but I, I well, didn't know. I think I read that 60% of Mexicans are Native Americans. So the same as 60% of Mexicans well, have at least some Mayan yeah. heritage. I don't know if anyone knows that. Sounds, sounds highly plausible to me. Way back. How are they related to Incas and Aztecs, uh, which were right around there, I believe? Well, the Incas are way down in South America. I, I have, in all the things I've read, I, I'm not aware of any connection between Mayans and Incas. It doesn't mean it wasn't it, but I'm just not aware. They did have contact with the Aztecs. The peak Mayan civilization occurred before the peak Aztec civilization. Uh, their calendars are almost the same. So there was some training, there were some similarities in the religion. The languages are different. I don't know how much people went back and forth. They both had what we call foreign or maize. So there were some similarities and some training and, and whatnot with the Aztecs. The Settled in Mexico City in that region. Right. And one of the things they found was a city that I don't know how to pronounce. It starts with T E O. That had dominated to call. But that particular place had been abandoned. And the Aztecs tended to see that as the city of the gods because it was so advanced compared to what they were at the time that they settled what we call Mexico City. So there's, again, there's some, go back to your question now, there's some, some historical connection between the Aztecs and the Mayans. Okay. So what's the tie between the Egyptian pyramids and the Mayan pyramids? I'm not aware of any connection between the, the Egyptian pyramids and any, either the Aztecs. Or insolence, or, yeah. There may, maybe there was some ancient business. I, I know there's speculation on that, but I'm not aware of anything that's, that's really been proven. Way in the back. What was the rationale for the Spaniards to destroy all the Mayan papers? <laughs> Heretics. Religion. The question was why, why did the Spanish destroy the Mayan documents? And the short answer is religion. What, what do we know about the Mayan religion? Like many religions, uh, it, it was polytheistic. So they had different, different uh, gods that they worshipped, different temples. A lot of the gods were, were taken to be in the form of animals. So they had the temple of the jaguar, for example. Beyond that, I have not studied. There have been a lot of sac human sacrifices. Certainly human sacrifices, yes. Oh, I thought the sun was extremely important to them. Sun was, the moon was, as well as to the Aztecs. If you look at their calendar, uh, I'll cover this book. Great book, Complete Illustrated History of Aztec and Maya. Uh, very light reading. But there's quite a lot of animal, sun, moon images just on the calendar, which reflects the importance. Bravo. Of the four documents that the Spanish didn't destroy, did we, what did we learn from those four documents? We learned some of the history of some of the royal dynasties. Like other places, they, they documented mostly on paper. And at other periods of time, some place, some things on stone, which did survive. So we learned something about when things happened, or this dynasty was replaced by that dynasty, or trade. Some of the paper documents that survive deal with uh, inventories of maze or other objects. So it's parts of the puzzle of trying to understand a civilization hundreds of years after it had essentially fallen. 
where it comes called the codex. Yeah, codex. C O D E X. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was going to point out, uh, Chaco Canyon in, in the southwestern United States, they found uh, evidence of trade with some of those civilizations down there in the form of the bird feathers. A lot of the and the in Chaco Canyon they used those for religious purposes. But there was some sort of trade between I mean, because they were carrots and things that yeah. wouldn't have lived in the south of it. Not surprising. Other questions? Comments? I would assume from whatever agriculture we had, they had to when it was a big city and prosperous, they had to clear away a lot of that. Yes, they had to clear away jungle and repeatedly. Yeah. And they fertilized. What do they have? Human and animal waste. Do they have any kind of organized structure with leadership today? And if so, what would they be struggling to actually try to get back? What they the rebellion was I don't know what structure they have. Pressure's Twofold. One is what structure do the minds have today and, and what are they advocating for? Yeah, what they for? Uh, language, being able to teach in, in their language instead of Spanish uh, has, has been a uh, repeated demand. Uh, more attention to the poor. I mean, the Mayans are an underclass. In terms of what the political structure might be, I don't have to say. One of the things that they did develop was a zero and a positional number system, which is was quite separate, you know, way we think it was quite separate from the regularity that has come down, you know, via uh, Eurasia. And, uh, it's interesting that the base of this system is twenty. So you have the ones instead of ones, tens, hundreds, etc. You have ones, twenties, four hundreds. Yeah. The, the comment was uh, twofold. One is that the Mayans did invent the concept of zero, independent. Um, I guess it was the uh, Arabic uh, scholars. And instead of a base 10 system, they tended to use a base 20 system. <coughs> which I guess means, you know, they use hands and feet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know this, but I often think, well, maybe it's because they were there in the jungle and had sandals and they could count on their toes as well as their fingers, so that's how this study got started. <laughs> I do know that there are tribes. Uh, or at least were in jungle tribes in New Guinea that had base six, and that was five for five fingers, and then and then six for the spear. <laughs> I would pay attention to six. Though. <laughs> I have a question. Um, the construction of the buildings, uh, every one of them looked like okay, and in my language the bricks are really quite smooth. But it, as you see the uh, area around there, uh, it is all uh, rough. How do, where, where do they start getting everything nice and smooth and uh, time looking? In, in the northern Yucatan, those cenotes, the ones I showed tended to be fairly, I'm going to call them regular. Others, you can see pictures of, are not. They were probably used as quarries. In the southern Yucatan, I don't have a good answer to the question, which is, where do all those rocks go? Uh, when, you, when you're up close and personal with a lot of the structure, they were really good craftsmen. Mm -hmm. It's not like there was a whole lot of gap. Stones were fit together perfectly. They were able to do that. They had, they had that ability. Quite a few of them very smooth. <coughs> they, they knew what they were doing. It's quite impressive. I had heard years ago, back, back in high school, that the only people who had invented the arch were the Greeks and the Romans. 
that's not strictly true. One of the structures we saw in, I think it was the call, was not quite an arch like this. It was more along these lines, so slightly different uh, assembly. Mm -hmm. but they, they didn't have a lot of the technology that I mentioned, but they knew how to deal with this stone. They were quite accomplished. But stone requires a uh, heavy concentrated tool. It does. And a lot of patience. And a way they, to, they didn't have steel to, to work these. And stone. a way to move it. And a way to move it. Yes. And you know, cutting those roads through the jungle, okay, that's that's a non-trivial operation, especially with what they had at the time. Well, that's evidence of volcanic rock or volcanic. Yep. Right? So, that could be a source. Yep. They, I mean, certain parts of Mexico, down through Central America, there are volcanoes. But that's evidence of considerable distance in those artifacts traveling. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your input and your time.